This is episode 25, Have the Hard Conversations with Molly wordak fault She's the Vice President of Corporate Partnership Activation at Illich Sports and Entertainment. We're doing a string of interviews with women in sports as we celebrate 50 years of Title IX. Title IX is the federal civil rights law in the United States that was passed as part of the Education Amendments of 1972 and prohibits sex-based discrimination in any school or other educational program that receives funding from the federal government. While there are a lot of things changing for women in the federal government right now, it is a time to celebrate Title IX and all the ways it's been able to impact women in the sports industry. You're listening to the Speak with Presence podcast. I'm Jen Valenga, here with my co-host, Jennifer Retley-Thomas. I'm JRT, and we're the co-founders of Voice First World. This podcast seeks to answer one question. What's stopping women from speaking up? We want women to speak with confidence in all their spheres of influence. Our guests share their stories and offer advice on speaking with presence without being perfect. If you are new here, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. If you've heard our story, skip ahead about a minute to get right into the episode. A decade ago, JRT and I were brought together to build creative university events. A professor of theater, I took on story development, script writing, and speaker coaching. An AVP of development, JRT was the genius behind operations, and she always showed up with a striking leadership presence. We loved working together. We laughed a lot, but we started to notice a world of difference. So many women speakers showed up prepared as perfectionists but not always confident in their delivery. When the pandemic hit, we all went to audio and video, where perfection is a challenge. Women muted themselves, turned off their cameras, stopped being heard. We wanted to do something. We know inequity in the workplace is systemic and not the fault of women, but together we'd gotten great results empowering and coaching them to speak with presence. It's one of the solutions to getting more women into higher levels of leadership and influence. We left our careers in higher ed to launch Voice First World, a coaching company located at the intersection of public speaking and leadership presence. Our purpose is to advance women in the workplace. If you want to know how you can speak with confidence in all your spheres of influence without being perfect, subscribe to our podcast. So, Jen Valinga, what do we have in store today for these powerful women speakers? We are foraying into the sports entertainment arena. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited about it. This is this is a string of sports professionals that we have coming up. So here's what we've got. Today we have Molly Wordak-Volt. She's the vice president of partnership activation. And she works across Detroit Red Wings, Detroit Tigers, and the entertainment arms of the business. She makes sure that there's exceptional service for the partners. It's flawless execution on on the shoulders of Molly. She's amazing. She works on renewal sales efforts and developing all kinds of deals that leverage sports and entertainment. So JRT, do you have a message for Molly from someone in her life? Here we go. In just a few short months, I feel like we've become fast friends and several phone calls and one long car ride. I know she's not only an outstanding leader within her organization, but one who truly cares about the people around her. I've come to greatly appreciate Molly's genuine offer to lend me her ear when I need it. And I'm grateful to have her on my team, although it's no Red Wings. Wink, wink. That is from Noelle Murhadi. And with that... Jen, I think we should bring this famous lady forward. Hello. How are you ladies doing? Have you ever had somebody start joining the podcast and crying? It happens a lot. That's kind of our goal. We want you to have wet mascara just as you enter. Now, we we want to make sure that you hear how amazing you are because we don't tell each other enough. Fantastic. Thank you. That is such a special way to start this conversation. That was wonderful. Thank you. Very welcome. Detroit is having a rebirth. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. We've been going through a little bit of a rebirth for a while. Had a little bit of a step back thanks to the good old pandemic, but you know, we're we're plugging forward and the city is 
raising to new heights. And it is very cool. I have lived here for 14 years, not from Michigan originally, but um, seeing where the city has come when I first moved here to where it is today, the development from retail, residential perspective, all of that is, is incredible. That's awesome. Can you share with us a time when you felt like a powerful speaker and maybe it was against all odds, but you came out feeling really powerful? We always love to start with a story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I've been thinking about this and one of the stories that came to mind was during the pandemic, actually, back in October of 2020, our organization had for as long as we could um, held on to our colleagues and our team members um, in a full capacity. Unfortunately, like many organizations, we ha- we came to a point where furloughs and, and layoffs were, were necessary. At the time, a, a lot of the decisions were being made at the top as far as who maybe was going to be affected by those decisions. And when my boss at the time came to me and, and informed me that um, in our team, we have a team of about 30, that we were going to have to furlough five team members from our group, and they were all going to come from my team. So we didn't- All? Yeah. So we didn't dive in. Uh, I'll give. I'll take a half step back. So in my role, I oversee all of partnership activation across our sports and entertainment properties. So Little Caesars Arena and the Red Wings, Detroit Tigers and Comerica Park, the Fox Theater, and the District Detroit, which is a 50 square block entertainment, live, work, play type of area in downtown Detroit. And so um, my team is responsible for all of the partners in, in all of those properties. So I have had a team of 13. And so five of my 13 team members were, were going to be affected. You know, he, he has been a great leader for me and has taught me a lot along the way. But this was a challenging step for the two of us because, you know, I was pretty much told that these are the team members from your group that that are going to be affected by this. And while I heard him loud and clear and I understood that, you know, potentially this decision was made and was farther down the path than maybe I had even realized, um, I felt in my heart of hearts that I needed to voice my opinion about why this was not the right path to go. There were a number of reasons why. One, I thought, you know, some of the team members that were on this short list, for lack of a better term, were integral to our business, had fantastic relationships with our clients. Another reason was, you know, we were going through a time where for in our business, we needed to take a completely new look at each and every one of our partnerships because a lot of the assets that we were delivering in contracts for partners, we couldn't do anymore, right? You can't have a table on the concourse when there's no fans in the stands, right? So we had to totally flip all of our contracts on their heads, look at it as a blank slate and really start over. And our team was the ones who knew the brands the best. They had the deepest relationships with these folks. They had the, um, they knew the ins and outs of the business and what their key performance indicators were. And so for me, it was a really challenging conversation, but important for me to make sure I was speaking on behalf of my team and, and letting him know that I did not believe that this was the right decision and that we should be reevaluating as to who was, you know, going to be affected by this. And here are my reasons why this was not a, I feel this is a, here's the business case as to why this is important. You know, you win some of those conversations and you lose some of those conversations. I didn't win that conversation, but for me, that was a time where I felt like my voice was important I needed to speak the truth. Not only was it important for me, but it was important for the team that I led to make sure that I, that I stood up for them and that they knew that they were a valuable part of this team, even if this wasn't going to end in the way that maybe we hadn't had hoped it would. 
You have to at least try. Right. That's exactly right. That's that's too bad it didn't it didn't work out the way that you wanted but you know it might have and so it's it's always worth it. Yeah, and you know I, I guess to to your point if if it didn't make an impact, you know, an immediate impact in that, you know, situation, my hope is that I presented the information so that if there is ever another time, then those type, that conversation would be in the back of that individual's mind. And, you know, maybe it's 10 years down the line in a totally, you know, different organization and environment, but understanding that side of the situation and that side of of the coin, frankly, um, you know, I'm hopeful that that will be impactful for that person moving forward. Yeah. The big picture of the whole thing is that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Molly, my question is, you know, you just gave an example of when you did use your voice. Mm -hmm. So describe a time or share what you believe is in the way of women speaking up. I think Maybe a couple reasons. Initially, um, I think that there's maybe this fear of retribution that if I speak up, you know, maybe people are going to think differently about me. But for me, it's so important for us to show our authentic selves, right? And we're, we don't always have the right answer. You know, Jen, you said it off the top. We're not perfect, but you know, we need to be authentic to who we are. And I think there is, there's so much fear for some, for, for women, I think that I need to be perfect. There's so much pressure that I need to do it the right way. I think that's why maybe, maybe we don't speak up. I also think that there's unnecessary tags on women that if I speak up, maybe I'm too emotional or I'm whiny Or I just think I don't. And honestly, I'm not sure why women get a bad rap. You know, I'm not emotional. I'm passionate. We've entered into the Instagram space and we tried our first hand at some some assets uh, around International Women's Day and Women's Week. And we did three, a series of three and we went out, you know, we did that cardboard trend and we said, she's not, it's exactly what you just said. What was it, Jenny? She's not emotional. Emotional. She's passionate. It's exactly what we said. And we like flipped it over. I'm going to send it to you so you can see it. I love that. Oh, I can't wait to see it. It's so true though, right? Like, and I, I can't, I don't know. I'd love your guys' take on it. I'm not sure why there are these unnecessary tags for women that candidly are not applied to men. You know, if somebody is, if, if a male, and this is, this is no discredit to, to males at all, but like, if there is somebody who is very animated in a meeting, a male who is very animated in a meeting, they don't get the rap that they're emotional. Nobody says to them, you're too emotional about this. We see them as passionate. We yeah. see them as leaders. Right. Yeah. And on the point of being emotional, I just, I was coaching with somebody earlier this morning who talked to me about, I showed up and I said what I needed to say. I was professional about it and I wasn't emotional. And we had already done some coachings. And I said, why do you think that is? And she said, I think, I think I had permission now. Mm -hmm. And now I can do it professionally instead of feeling like, oh, I don't know if I should do this. Maybe I'll get emotional because am I supposed to, or am I not supposed to now? All of a sudden she has this power of like, no, that's actually my job. Right. But to answer your question about why is that, I think sometimes we don't feel we have permission to. No, I couldn't agree more with that because there is definitely this, you know, especially as, as as you are elevated within an organization, like you have to make business decisions, not emotional decisions. Right. And that we all know that that's so important, but, and I know very much in our line of work in, in sports and entertainment that, um, there is very little, and maybe this is a function of um, it being a male dominated profession. I'm not sure. I don't know, but there's very little emotion. And to your point, maybe um, that it is almost frowned upon 
as opposed to allowing people, men and women alike, that emotion is okay. Like, let's have empathy for one another. Like, let's show some emotion, you know? Um, as, if, as if sports and entertainment aren't emotional. Right. Like, come on. Exactly. Exactly. They are. They ex- exhibit and exude so much emotion out of everyone. You know, mm-hmm. I go back to the example that I gave in the beginning about the, about the furlough situation. There was a lot of dialogue leading into those conversations with colleagues about not being emotional. Deliver the message. This is a business decision. Um, you know, and I had a very hard time with that. These are people that some that I had worked with for years and I didn't do a very good job listening. Uh, you know, I showed emotion and I showed empathy because being unemotional, not being, um, not being relatable and to these colleagues, I, I just, it just wasn't authentic to who I was. So I think that there has to be a better um, appreciation and a better balance for when emotion is okay and appropriate versus giving people an unnecessary tag when, it, you know, I'm not trying to be emotional. I'm trying to be passionate, right? Like, I think there's a fine balance. And if, if a furlough moment isn't a, the appropriate time for emotion, when is? Right. Seems like that should be pretty emotional. And in the middle of a global pandemic, I mean, crazy. I hope we don't get you in trouble. No, listen, this is, this is <laughs> nothing about, um, about that leader at the time. You know, he was, he was doing his job and, um, and it was, it was an organization, organizational decision. And I, I don't fault him. I don't fault the organization. For me, it was, it's just about, and I would tell him this, if he was sitting on this, you know, on this stream with us, I, it's just, and he knows, like, I spoke very passionately about why I didn't think that this was the right decision. Um, but at the end of the day, if this is the decision mm-hmm. that is made, then okay, we move forward as a collective group. And, um, you know, that that's what we have to do. Okay, let me ask this. What do you think is the impact of women not speaking up in the long term? I think it sets a bad precedent, candidly, for those that are watching us, Mm. anyone, right? (laughs) Whether it's, um, you know, other people in the room, whether it's people that work for you. um, You know, we talk a lot um, in in our business about it, it, probably in many others too, right? Um, Looking at diversity in in our leadership team, in our workforce in general. And if you see it, you can be it, right? If I had seen more women when I was coming up through the, through the business in my seat or, or wherever, like there might have been more women who, you know, came along on this journey with me. And I think it's the same for the impact that we make. If the negative impact, if we're not speaking up, it's setting this precedent that I should be quiet at the table. I may be the only, or one of the only women in the room I should let the men lead the conversation. You know, we should be leading the way. I have a I have a gentleman that I work with, and one of his favorite quotes is, "Past performance is the best indicator of future performance." And I totally agree with that. And I think it's so applicable in this particular scenario. If we don't establish the behavior and the pattern of speaking up when it's appropriate and with the mo- in the most professional and you know, environment, of course, we're, how can we ever expect anybody else around us to model that good behavior and then do the same thing and carry that type of behavior forward? Are there many women like you in your, in your space? Um, It's, there are more women. We are, we are being more strongly represented than we have in the past. Um, But we are definitely still underrepresented. What kind of bias have you had to overcome to be in the position you're in as a woman in leadership in the sports industry? This is it's a really good question. I am certain that I have probably experienced bias. I'm certain of it. I have tried very very hard to not make my gender 
an excuse for why I'm not going to get somewhere. And I realized that doesn't apply to everybody. And I may have had an easier path than somebody else in an underrepresented group. But I have tried to say to myself, I'm going to control everything I can control. I'm going to work as hard as I can work. I'm going to find advocates who believe in who I am and what I'm doing, who can tell my story just as well as I can tell my own story. And I'm going to carve my own path. And I'm going to not let the fact that we only have one or two women in our senior leadership team be a reason why I can't be in that seat. And I know it sounds probably a little, oh, people are probably watching. Oh, she's, she's, yes, all talk. But I, I, I really, I really believe it. Like, I think you chart your own path and it's not always easy. It's not, but I can only control what I can control. And we talk a lot about that in our team. Um, you know, I talk a lot about that from a culture perspective. Like, oh, if your organization, whatever organization it might be, I feel like the organization has great culture. That may be true, and that's not great and not fun, but can we control it within our own team? And so how do I, you know, how do I just keep plugging in? I know, like, that good things are going to come my way, right? If I keep doing the right thing, if I stay on the right path, help other women along, pull other women with me, right? Like, this is amazing. What a you great concept. Amazing. What exactly. a great concept. <laughs> right? Right? This is not about like, let me get to the top first and knock everybody down as I'm trying to get there because I'll be pretty lonely at the top if that's the case, right? Right. Um, you know, rising tides raise all boats. And I think that that's so important, right? So good. Thank you. Thank you. So do you have any solutions for encouraging women to use their voices? When we talk about solutions, I think first and foremost is figuring out what your core values are, mm -hmm. because I think that that will help people sort of find their voice and know kind of what their true north is. And how, how do I stay very focused and aligned with what that is? I think also being confident, and I know that that is easier said than done, but I think being confident comes with practicing and having uncomfortable conversations like the conversation I had with the furlough. I could have very easily just not had that conversation, but helping me to be a stronger voice, to be what I think is, is a better leader than where I was a year ago, two years ago, is putting myself into those types of environments where I need to stretch myself and um, maybe get a little bit uncomfortable. So I gain more confidence having that voice and speaking up when I believe that it's necessary. I also think that we have a responsibility to be very clear about what we're asking for, what we're speaking about, right? Again, it kind of goes back to this like, setting that precedent for people who are watching us, we do have a responsibility to do it the right way. Because that's what you said. You have to, it's practice too, but the more you have the hard conversations, the less difficult they become. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank Jen and JRT so much. You guys are amazing. This is an incredible resource that you are providing for, for everyone, not just women. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to spend some time with you both today. I look forward to continued conversations. Oh, thank you so much. We are not perfect, but we are trying to do our part. So thank you for acknowledging that. Yes, thank you. We adore you and keep having the hard conversations. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's show. A brand new episode releases every Tuesday. If you like what you've heard and you're interested in seeing if it's a good fit for us to work together, here's what to do. Go to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply to book a free call. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes to get you clear on three things. What's stopping you from speaking up? Who needs you to speak with confidence in your spheres of influence? 
and how you can speak with presence to advance your career. School didn't prepare us for a voice-first world. The less you speak, the more you fall behind. But you don't have to be perfect, and we can help. We've helped women across industries own their expertise, articulate their worth, and share their stories for the digital age. To see if we can help you, head over to voicefirstworld.com forward slash apply. I'm Jen V. And I'm JRT. Let's talk soon. And keep having the hard conversations.